Um, all right, so thank you guys. Thank you guys uh, for joining us. Um, we are live, just getting the word and we're live. Um, happy, what is it now? <laughs> Wednesday, we can't, the, you know what? The time is flying, isn't it? It's just like, how did we get to December already, right? <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, but guys, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have an, another incredible uh, individual in the building all the way in Vancouver, Vancouver, Canada. Vancouver, Canada. I think. <laughs> and uh, we have Edward Sylvan with us today. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Edward. Um, so I'm going to get right into it, guys. Um, it has been uh, an incredible ride, as you can imagine, with like you've been witnessing and observing uh, this year <laughs> with the prolonged bear market. Uh, but um, I'm going to start off by um, asking, you know, uh, getting to know you first. Um, how how are you, Edward? Uh, you know, how's life in Canada? Tell us more about yourself and your your journey. Excellent. Thank you, first of all, for having me on this uh, on this adventure with you today. Hello, everybody out mm -hmm. there. Um, I, I, uh, a little bit about me and my journey. I'm Edward Sylvan. I'm the uh, president and CEO and founder of my company, Sycamore Entertainment, that I built along mm -hmm. with uh, some very good close colleagues and my brother. And we and what we do is we essentially uh, we're in the film business. We essentially buy and buy and sell movie rights that from uh, movie producers who have completed films. And what mm -hmm. we do is we take their films and assist them to get their films seen by the general audience. So a lot of times filmmakers are creative to, and they make, they, they make a finished product, but they might not have the savvy and the relationships to have that product seen by an audience. So we step in there and, and we, we help doing that. We help do that. As far as I am, I'm I'm uh, I'm fantastic. I'm I, you know it's a little rainy over here, perhaps like like the UK, but uh, I'm getting ready. Same. For <laughs> Same here. It's raining in London, uh, and I, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, we're known for terrible weather, but uh, is that the case where you are right now with winter? Yeah, it's a little it's a little bit rainy where we are right now for the rest of the holiday season. It, is it true that you have the worst winters in Canada? Like your, yours are more prolonged? Um, it depends on what part of you are. We're on the West Coast on the Pacific Ocean. So our, uh, all up and down the Pacific no Northwest, it's in winter, it's more rainy. We, mm. uh, down, in, down, down in the lower land, it's mostly rain and maybe one or two days of snow. And in the, in the mountainous areas where they ski and everything, it's, it's heavy snow. But where I am, it's, it's just prolonged rain for sometimes weeks on end, what, endless rain. But uh, it's, it's fairly mild, um, just over 35, 40 degrees most of the time, but uh, mm. very, very few that it does it dip below zero degrees. Mm. Okay, well, you know, this year in particular with the bear market, with this uh, industry, um, I'd love to get your take on it. Um, but in fact, before we get into that, I, I just want to expand on your life journey um, from early on, because I was reading your written interview and it was incredibly inspiring. And I wanted to, uh, if you can take us back, I need you to go back in your uh, memory bank and uh, go back to uh, when you were younger. Uh, grow, have you, were you born and raised and lived in Canada all your life or did you move from somewhere else? Yeah, I lived in, Can I was born in Toronto, so I, I'm a Canadian. I lived in Canada my whole life. However, I've worked uh, at several different, I've worked in the U.S. And, and did a little bit of work in Europe in the past, but uh, but I'm, I'm a Canadian. Mm. Yes. Okay. And what's your background in terms of your uh, occupation uh, when you were coming up, uh, when, when you were... Uh, younger you said you you're in the uh, in the finance and the entertainment business uh, but I want to know a bit more in regards to your early career moves uh, growing up as a uh, a young brother tell us more about that uh, aspect of your life w what really captured your imagination as, as I said in that interview where it all started I'm, I'm a from when I was a young I, I'm an avid lover of movies and so mm. uh, you know as a very young kid I would go watch films with my brother and his girlfriend like when we were in our teens we would just mm. spend some of our time watching films and and uh one day I was just was just um you know we I, I wasn't even employed at the time but I went to see a film 
called Wall Street. It's going way, way back. It's one, of, it's one of my favorite films. And I was literally, had, knew nothing about the investment markets, knew nothing about, about uh, the stock market. But this mm. movie, all the movies I've seen, it just captivated my, it just captivated my imagination how, how it all worked and, and the whole financial part of it and how money moved. And I was literally intrigued. And I left the theater saying, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what they were talking about in that theater. <laughs> all I know is I want to be a part of that. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so I literally, without any knowledge, as I said in my piece, I, I literally, with no knowledge, went out and started trying to figure out reading newspapers. On uh, there was no internet or anything like that back then going on. I just tried oh. to figure out how, how can I go and get into this business. And I, I literally went through the newspapers and found out that you know where where uh, where I live, it's uh, it's called Bay Street, just like the, the the Canadian Wall Street in Toronto is Bay Street. So I literally. Mm that time walking up and down Bay Street just walking into places and just asking questions how can I get a job here literally and I landed a job at an insurance company and um and as a as a messenger and from there mm. I it just uh, that job as a messenger allowed me to get into all the financial trading rooms of all mm. the companies and including the stock exchange because I had to deliver packages there and that's yeah when, really took off and I, I got to look around and get to meet people and, and one thing led to another and I realized I had to study and take courses so I, I was going to school at the time and I went to university but I had to take industry specific courses so I took those courses as well and and as things progressed I just kept moving up and learning and understanding the business and and then mm. everything just took off from there. And you know, you know all those movies. I, I still remember. I, it still catches me sometimes uh, when I uh, so, someone mentions it. But do you remember when Pursuit of Happiness came out? Absolutely. That movie and it, me of myself. <laughs> I'm telling you, it it it. it um, what did it i'm trying to encapsulate that moment but it's so hard to describe the conversation it it, it started the emotions it, it invoked in um african-american men um you know looking after their their sons and daughters and and really right. trying to uh, drive that conversations because we've always been used to that single mother on a welfare narrative right but then to right. see the struggles of uh, an african-american man and holding it down and not giving up no matter what like speak right. to that like how much of that related to your life as well almost almost all of it i i, I do come from a, a home where uh, uh there was only one parent my mother and, I, and mm -hmm. my neighbor, you know we were a bunch of guys and we were really up to no good Truly, we <laughs> after no time. good in the neighborhood, I got one little <laughs> a monk. You're moving to your <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, first Prince of Bel Air uh, just entered my mind. Go ahead. <laughs> all of my brothers were just up to no good. We were, we were all in school, so at, at least we knew enough to stay in school, but we didn't really have any opportunities. Uh, nobody who looked like us was doing anything of any significance. You know, I'm only mm. five foot seven. Uh, you know, so I, you know, my basketball career wasn't going to happen. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's never too late, you know. There might, yeah. You could be the next Chris Paul or LeBron or whatever. You might have a side talent that we don't know. Like, you Unless know? I have a growth spurt, I don't know if that's going to happen. But, <laughs> but how, how, how I kept out of trouble was going to the movie theaters. And, you know, a, a lot of my friends were getting into trouble. Some of them were involved in drugs. So we mm. just didn't have any real outlet none of our parents were doctors we were first generation uh my parents were immigrants from trinidad they were you know their oh. job was to keep working and put food on the table so we didn't have mm -hmm. any mentors we didn't have anybody who we could follow who was successful we were all just doing so i i used movies as a way to sort of get out and see what was going on in the world as a as, a, as an escape and and you know when i saw that film wall street i realized that you know, my grades were okay, but I wasn't going to, from where I come from, people who had money mm. were doctors and lawyers. Mm. I knew that I didn't have the grades for that, but this movie showed me people who weren't doctors and who weren't lawyers, but they they had a lifestyle that I wanted to, to get mm. to. So I, I said to myself, that's what I want to do. I don't know how it works, but these guys have money. I want to be able to get involved in that. And that's what sparked the inspiration for me. So I got to figure out how this works and get into that business. Mm. Well said. And what about what are your thoughts in regards to um, that debate? I mean, it's been uh, growing uh, enormously over the years. Um, 
you know, the, the conversations that we're having in our community, even in the diaspora, we're having the same common issues, uh, common concerns, uh, common struggles. Uh, what would you say in regards to, um, you know, if you have any like uh, life quotes or any any particular moments where you felt like, um, you know, looking back at your younger years and and how, you know, sometimes you might I, I, you must catch yourself at times thinking I cannot believe I've made it or I cannot believe I'm here like me little old me like tell me a bit more in regards to any particular moments in your life where, you know, it just gave you this profound uh thing whatever it is and that's kept you sustained for all of these years what, what has that been if, if you can if you remember that moment or moments there's been several over the years I, I must admit every year because of what i do in my business i spend a lot of time at film festivals around the world and uh toronto sundance i i i my business takes me to some of the most exotic places in the world and Sometimes I'm standing, you know, on the red carpet at Cannes because one of my clients is having a film and the, all the, the, the photograph, the photographers are taking pictures of me and my clients and A-list celebrities. And sometimes I, it, 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 it's astounding of, of, of how I'm here because um, Michelle Obama, just if I can just sort of digress, Michelle Obama, just a few days ago on one of her stops on her book tour, she made a comment and she says that even though she has been in some of the most powerful rooms in the world, she still has what she calls imposter syndrome. I, it means that yeah. it means it means that you, you feel as if I, I understand it because I'm I, I'm I'm consulting to millionaires and billionaires and people who shake uh, um, pop culture and they're looking to me for my consulting. And sometimes you get the feeling is like, you know, why are they listening? Why should they, these people listen to me? And, and so I get those moments, but then at the same time, I realized, you know, I snapped out of it and I worked hard. I know what I'm talking about. I deserve this. I've struggled for this and you know, my knowledge has value. So I go back and forth, but it's those profound moments, you know, in these, places where most people only dream to be where I'm consulting to some of the people who are going to shape how the world thinks and does things for the rest of their lives and they're looking mm -hmm. to me. that's when it hits me that's when my wow moment comes and it comes often because I'm there very often and speaking of Michelle Obama I have profound uh, admiration for her um, I can't imagine the struggles and the uh immense scrutiny and pressure she's been especially in the eight years in the white house um but it yeah i i can definitely uh i, I heard her say about that imposter syndrome because she was in london speaking to a group of school uh children in regards to that so um yeah i completely uh, understand what you mean by that um so going back into uh, your line of of uh, passion your work your your career uh before you got into the blockchain space tell us more about because you said you were in the financial industries financial and um also that led you to spot a gap uh, in the market regarding the financing of movies um and also with uh, bringing the you know the the two worlds together fine uh, the wall street and uh hollywood so speak more about your journey regarding that how did you get into despite having no uh, knowledge experience um how 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 specifically did you get into um the uh finance industry and how did you spot that gap in the market and with your love and passion of the entertainment industry how were you able to forge connections with them and and trying to bring them together so it's a bit of a mouthful but yeah, yeah no, but it's, <laughs> but it's, it's a great question thanks for asking um as i said when i was when i first broke into the financial industry as just sort of a, a low-level employee I, I built relationships making stops every day to these trading desks, these high level financial trading desks. And, and I, through study and, and through relationships, I landed a job on one of these desks as an assistant to one of the top traders. That mm. led me to come to understand that um, these, these media companies, whether it's film production or cable companies or these types of television stations, they 
they always managing substantial amounts of money. Not only are they public companies, but they have money in cash that they want to earn money on. So they invest it like you and I would invest our money. So I worked on these desks and I realized that these, that there's substantial amounts of money coming into film and film business makes ridiculous amounts of money. And that was my, that was a passion before I knew anything about the financial business. So I learned how film companies earn money, how they spend money. And I took that knowledge with me. Um, and we our, our team started financing movies in Hollywood from where I worked on the East Coast in Toronto. And I learned that business. And from there, I, I also, in my travels, I also started meeting actual filmmakers because we would go talk to them about their project to decide whether we wanted to make the capital investment. And as I started to real, as I started to understand, and I would sit in a room with creative type people, and I and I would be on the other side would be financial people, and I understood that they were speaking, but they were speaking over one understood art and one understood business, and they would never mm. it would be such a battle between each one of their agendas. And I sat and I realized that a lot of stuff didn't get done because the creative person didn't understand to package an investment so that it would be understood by an investor. They had so much passion, but that's all they had. They didn't have the structure underneath that passion in order to get the financing they needed. The money was there, but the structure wasn't there. So I saw a lot of deals fall. And the only, the only deals that were ever getting done were the deals by the big studios, the big companies that were doing it forever. But the small independent guy who had a great project, and that's all he had in his passion, he wasn't getting finance. And I realized there's, a, there's room for these guys. And that's when I really started to understand there's a bridge that needs to be crossed. And that's mm. when I started learning the, the art of production, filmmaking, with my knowledge of finance and working on trading desks and how money worked. And I started to be almost like I was an interpreter between the two worlds and bring these deals, these independent deals closer together. Because you've got to remember, a lot of these independent filmmakers, they don't have structure around them business managers and consultants and lawyers mm -hmm. they don't have those people around them they have a camera and a script and that's it so they didn't have that financial structure to build something that they can sell to the market and i was mm -hmm. the person who saw that opportunity brought it together so i started helping these filmmakers package themselves in order to be able to raise the money they needed to complete their films and that's when i saw the opportunity Mm. And I, I love the fact uh, when, when I was reading uh, the written interview, I love the, the part where we, you were speaking about Laundell 10. So yes. if you can uh, speak in regards to that, because um, from what I understand, it's going to be a hub for films made right. by people of color for people of color. And I right. think that is slap bang um, in the, there seems to be this uh, optimism, um, especially after uh, the, the success of Black Panther. Now right. the, the, the shift, the narrative has also been, hey, but why aren't we seeing more black filmmakers, uh, right. black producers, directors, actors, uh, and one of the concerns that we have in the communities that billion dollar um you know revenue that disney made is it disney or i'm not sure exactly who else marvel, profited but marvel, marvel studios was the marvel studios um and uh, they they made a I, don't, I think it was a gross figure over a billion dollars and counting. Now, how much of that will be going to our communities? Um, how much of that will be going to the uh, black actors and actresses? And really it's about ownership um, and, and finding ways that we can, uh, you know, profit and, and expand from, from our creativity, our uh, assets that we, you know, essentially acquiring assets. So how, I like the fact that you, you've got this gap in the market and you're turning into niche but really speak to that because I think it's so important and um, it, it would allow us to have an idea of, of how the, the magnitude um, of the problem of the issue and if, how, what can we do to overcome that and what are your answers what is your solution to that I, I, I've, spoken at, I've spoken at length uh, on television and various news articles about what you're saying there and the reason I, I purchased Lawndale 10, which is a, a 10 screen movie theater in, Chicago, in the Chicago area that's predominantly black, 
Uh, it, in fact, it used to be Magic Johnson Cinemas, and we, we bought it. Mm. Uh, it was one of his many cinemas, and we purchased it. Um, it's, it's sitting in a community that services a, a, a Black community, but it's very rare that a film that speaks to the community is playing in the cinema. It's mostly studio films or films that are great films, but it's not about people who look like us uh, speaking about issues that people that look like us face. So I said, you know, these movies aren't getting through the system in the way that they need to be get to the public. And the ones that do get to the public, they get huge accolades, they win awards. I can go on Moonlight, Hidden Figures, Black mm. Panther, but like the ones that do break through and, and are seen by the general public, not only do they speak to a specific audience, but these movies cross over into the mainstream because they're about universal themes. And these stories, they, these are the types of stories that the general public needs to see so that they can realize our problems are the same as your problems. There is no us in you where everybody's the same. So, so, but at the same time, these movies will get the support. These, these original films by, by, by blacks will, will have a core audience just because of the subject matter. And then from there, they can grow. That's the reason why we, we, we got Lawndale so that we can go out there and purchase rights to these films and they have a home where they can take on its own life because if the movie's mm. doing well in one cinema and the social media word gets out in another city, cinemas in that city will call us and they'll play the movie in that city. And that's how movies spread by word of mouth. Word of mouth is word of mouth. It's just changed from actual speaking to social media, but it's still word of mouth. So that's the reason why we, we, we purchased that. To speak to your other point of view, is that what needs to happen for more of these films to, to come to light is they need financing. Fin the finance piece of it is the most important. It's, you know, art can't be art without finance because mm. it's very, very capital intensive to make. Um, and the money is in certain places. It's, it's, it's with certain high net worth individuals. Yes, there are high net worth individuals in the black community, athletes and entertainers, but it's so narrow we need we need to speak to broader audiences in terms of where we get our money from and that's where my knowledge of the finance business comes in because uh, because money money doesn't really have color um money money's money and, and i think that if these filmmakers with their talent can show they have talent but at the same time show their business acumen about returning the investment to the original investor and they understand that part of it also these filmmakers can go on to, to be as successful as any filmmaker. And that's really my objective. It's why I started the company. It's why I called it Sycamore Entertainment. Sycamore Entertainment was, a, was during the days of American slavery, was a tree where black people gathered for safety and, and for, for safety and for uh, shelter. And mm. they, they, taught, they taught each other under the sycamore tree. That's why I called my company mm -hmm. Sycamore Entertainment because it was a place of learning and a place of growth for black people. And that's why, uh, the, the, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm taking the opportunity of the lack of knowledge of, of finance and putting it together with, 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 um, with filmmaking on an independent level and so that I can get these films seen by, by a broader audience because they're, they're, the stories are just incredible. And I speak about that um, on many different occasions and it's out, it's out there on the web for other people to see if they'd like to read about it. And that's really important, that part uh, that you spoke in regards to uh, the history of the sycamore tree, but also yeah. you touched upon uh, building bridges and that there's no, uh, the, the color of money is uh, indifferent, it's, it's, uh, indifferent. it affects uh, everyone. However, let's go back to um, how specifically with African-American community and the diaspora, uh, black people everywhere in all, uh, you know, shades, tribes, continents, uh, worldwide. How, do, because this, here's the thing, is so true regarding representation. We seem to be the one that uh, bring the creative aspect. We're trendsetters. We're the ones that make things pop, you know, lively, vibrant, something about our energy. So, like all the, we, we are the source where this, we bring the swag, but there seems to be this disconnect. It's like um, some sort of chasm where how can we be, um, you know, having a collective, uh, sp speaking just with the African American community's uh, spending power over a trillion dollars or a couple of trillion dollars a year, that, that figure keeps changing. But the fact that we have that level of collective uh, 
purchasing power, how can we communicate or create incentives or ways to divert some of that into uh, our filmmakers, into the, the black film industry? And, and how do we uh, create mechanisms um, uh, and and inspire people to say, hey, you know what, uh, I'm going to reduce my reliance on on uh, you, you know trying to keep the black dollar within our community. How how do I really uh, I need things to survive, but how can I actively uh, proactively be looking to support my brothers and sisters wherever they may be? But then yep. there are also consumers, aren't there? Um, non um, Non, uh, non blacks that worldwide would love to uh, purchase and buy things uh, from us. But, you know, how do we communicate and make that practically possible? Because it's, it's just like, a you know, we're just talking and not doing taking enough action. Exactly. Um, and, and the general public, they're aware of that. There's no, there's very few, there's very, in, in the advertising world, which I deal in also, sort of digress, but advertising dollars do very rarely go specifically to a black community. The reason for that is, is that the advertisers at large know that if they just put it out there to everybody, the black population will, will come along. So, so until that changes, um, like, for, for example, I'll give you fashion. Let's talk fashion for a minute. Louis Vuitton and Nike and all of these fashion brands, Gucci, they don't market specifically to a black community. They don't. They market to everybody. Blacks see this, pick it up, wear it, and that the fact that LeBron James is wearing Gucci, now everybody's wearing Gucci. So he's so so the advertising agencies and the brands they get free advertising because they don't have to market to LeBron in order to get him over. They just have to put it out there. Quality they put quality out there, and it, uh, quality attracts the, the mainstream, and that's how the mainstream gets their product. It, that's how products get into the mainstream. They're picked up by people who man people who drive pop, pop, pop culture. And it goes mainstream. So to answer your question specifically, we need to be, as a, as a community, we have to put out quality product, whether it's film, clothing, um, artwork. It doesn't matter what it is. If the product in and of itself is quality, mm. it will, it, the, 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 the pop culture will grab onto it and bring it forward. But to create products of quality, again, it takes capital. It takes money, and that's where we 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 fail as a as a as a group of people. Our ability to attract and influence that money to invest in us, so that we can build that quality product, so that it can make it to the mainstream. Do you see the Do you see the steps that's needed in order to get there? You know, mm. and that's what we and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help filmmakers in my small world help filmmakers. I know the product is quality already. You see it on the screen. Let's take let's take Moonlight or that movie that was done by uh it's, it was called Get Out. It was a it was a horror film. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A British are, actor, yeah. Yeah, those were quality pieces of, of 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 screenwriting that that won awards. There's so much of that quality out there, but it's only mm. a very small sliver of that quality product that ever makes it to market. Why? Because most of the filmmakers they just don't have the capabilities to raise the money find the capital and the resources in order to get their film from script to screen. That's what I do. So I, I, I'm trying to answer the question as specifically as possible. And that is that you have to make quality products and, and then those quality products have to get into the hands of the people who can bring it to, to the mainstream. Without mm. that, it's nothing's going to change. Mm. So it's really about fostering a new, that, that new mentality, uh, fostering the energy that we have and creating Black Wall Streets worldwide, wherever right. we may be. And, right. and I guess with what you said is so important, the quality speaks for itself, because one of the issues that we have in our community is, uh, you know, a dubious customer service or, you know, uh, thinking that we can ask discounts or whatever. It's like, right. you know... So sorry, did you want to add no, to that? No, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing to, to, 
to what you're saying. So, you know, we, mm. we, we've achieved excellence in, in certain fields, um, mm. primarily athletics, um, uh, sports, sports, all athletics, um, as well as acting. We've, we've achieved excellence, but there's other areas that um, we're capable of achieving excellence, but we lack the exposure to it. So therefore, mm. not, um, learn what the skills needed in order to achieve excellence. There's a certain mm. level of, of, of being kept out. And I, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of, of the fact that a lot of Blacks, not only in America, North America, but around the world, we pri the biggest area that we've been kept out of is the area of financial knowledge. Mm. Um, That's true. Basic financial knowledge in order to be able to achieve the things we want to achieve. That's the biggest tragedy that's, that's, that's happened. And as a result of that lack of financial knowledge, we're not mm. participating in the, in, the, in the global economic prosperity of the world in terms of stock market growth. When the stock market in North America is up to record highs or, or in London, the, the, the market's up to record highs, who, who are the majority of the people that benefit from that increase? It's, it's, mm. it's not us because we're not participating not, yeah. in the game. And that's because, you know, you know, just canvas your friends. How many of your friends that you know who are black even have investment accounts or are invested in any of the products and services you need? You probably, we all probably have iPhones. We probably all wear Nike. We probably all watch Disney movies, but none of us have I, Apple stock. We don't own Nike stock. We don't own Disney stock. But yep. we're consumers of it. We're the ones driving Consumer. it. Consuming it mm -hmm. from it. That's why when I was interviewed on the other thing and I said, you know, I would have an initiative that allowed participation for us because that that trillion, that multi-trillion dollar spending power, purchasing power we have goes into the ability to drive those companies to record profits and we're not participating. So how, so, and that's because of the lack of the financial knowledge in our community. We're great consumers, but we're terrible investors. Mm. Great consumers, but terrible investors. That is, <laughs> that's, you shouldn't put that as a title of a, a slogan or book or hashtag it or something, because that has just nailed it, literally uh, put it in a nutshell. Um, so tell us more as well about your uh, journey to blockchain. How did you hear about Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptos? What was your initial ideas and thoughts? And um, how has your experience been so far? How have you managed to survive the ups and downs as well? You know, what was it like? You know what? It's, um, again, for, for me, because of what I do, we're uh, and, and the space we operate in, we're always on the forefront of information and technology, whether mm. it's different ways to distribute movies, to streaming, we're always seeing stuff coming first. Blockchain is, blockchain, and we're, uh, our business is very high in, in um, service in terms of, there's so many different steps from a, a movie being created to mm -hmm. a movie being seen on the screen. There's so many different people in between that process. And everybody along that process is making money, taking fees, um, increasing that cost. It's, it's basically the supply chain of movies. So mm. within the supply chain, all blockchain is is doing as a general, you know, as a, as a, as a macro idea, all blockchain is doing is decreasing the amount of people in that supply chain. And as not only is it decreasing the amount of individuals in that supply chain, it's lowering the cost of every stop that that product has to make, whether it's movies, goods and services, banking, the more people you eliminate out of the supply chain, the more profitable it is for the people who are in still in the supply chain. And that's what mm. that's so. So when, when blockchain came along, it was a natural fit for our industry because of all the different steps within the supply chain of a movie. So if you can, so, and, and, and the reason that it makes sense within the film business is because um, the creative person, the writer, the filmmaker and the actors, those are the people who are, who are the, despite how much money actors make, and, and the creative people making a movie project, they are the least compensated of anybody. Mm -hmm. and they're the ones doing the, they're the ones doing the acting. They're the yep. ones creating the script. 
but and if a, so and if a movie makes a billion dollars like black panther the people who brought it to life the writers the directors and the actors they get paid well by anybody's standards but nowhere near the billions of dollars that the yep. studio have made so 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 blockchain has come into the marketplace and stands to um, redistribute some of that wealth along the supply chain and give it back to the people who created the the, the art in the first place. So it's a natural fit for, for what, so when I saw it, the first question I asked was how, what is blockchain? How does it work? And how can we implement it into my industry? So when, so it's just about finding the right team around you uh, uh, and finding the people who can make that a reality. And that's what, mm -hmm. that's how we started to incorporate the tokens and the blockchain into Sycamore. And, uh, and incorporate it with Lawndale 10. So it's a, there's a few steps in there, but but it makes great economic sense. You know what, that actually reminds me of um, uh, one of the aspects I love about the blockchain is also um, the fact that it's immutable and also it's uh, transparent uh, regarding um, the business, uh, with movie industry, with the music industry, over the uh, decade or so with the advent of disruptive technology, we've seen, um, you know, do, do you remember the, I'm sure I remember the Napster case as well and, um, and, and what the big guys have been getting away for decades exploiting these artists and I, I did hear because, um, a, in fact, a friend of mine uh, who's a producer, um, he informed me, he was teaching me how to make beats uh, way back, I think about <laughs> um, and he was telling me about how the, the the they hardly get rewarded for anything for their royalties, publishing or whatever, ownership, hardly anything. So this, especially for people of color. And right. so um, yeah. that reminds me the 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 what do you call it the the rights aspect, the copyright aspect, the uh, yeah. fact that yeah. these yeah. big boys will no longer be bullying the you know the the the. Yeah. the speak on that a bit because that's so crucial yeah it's all about whether it's music or or film it's all about intellectual rights management and 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 rights financial distribution and that's what the blockchain seeks to uh level the playing field um you know whether whether you're getting your, your the royalties due to you on a movie track or whether you're even even if your 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 movie or your music is being pirated blockchain seeks to eliminate that and put the money uh, back to the rightful owner. Um, and, and so when, when we're hearing about, it's all really about intellectual property rights. Copyright, mm -hmm. and, and, and that it, it applies to entertainment of which music and film, which of which African-Americans are predominant in, in terms of our art, our craft. So, so with that, it's a natural fit. And it's just about, so you can literally replace it, music, film rights, it's, they're interchangeable. So, so as an opportunity, it's, it's a natural fit. And um, companies were building management tools for non-entertainment type products. But once you understand your general concepts, you can make them apply. So there's a handful of different companies out there that are creating technologies for intellectual rights, uh, rights management for music. We just took mm. that app and we re and we retooled it and made it applicable to the blockchain. Everything from the from the film rights to the to the movie rights to all the ancillary movie rights going down from Netflix right down to looking at look at watching it on your phone. All those mm. rights now are going to be managed and distributed on the blockchain. And all the people who have uh, an interest in the uh, uh, a vested interest in, in the in the success of that film from the writer to the actors to the creator to the directors they're all going to be on the blockchain and they're going to get in real time what's due to them based on their ownership interest in that film in real time as opposed to the, the money being handled or misspent or misused Mm. And you know what, that actually um, reminds me as well, it's, it's not just a one time thing, isn't it? It's so it's been so uh, pervasive, historically speaking, we as a community have been ripped off, we've been exploited, we've been uh, mis misappropriated our ideas out, you know, uh, the, for example, Kente Cloth's Ankara uh, from Africa, 
uh, they're made in China and they're, they're illegally sold as uh, being, uh, the, 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 some of the sellers act as if they're Africans. Um, and it's, it's not the first time anyway that we've witnessed this. We've seen the fashion houses as well take some um, ideas and, and they say certain things like inspired or uh, so something else, but really they don't give their financial credit uh, or even speak about uh, it, you know, so misappropriation is it's not nothing new to us so not yeah they're able to do it and because there's again it, again i'm going to keep saying this like a, because there's we lack the financial resources not only to defend ourselves mm. we lack the financial resources to protect ourselves but we also lack the financial resources to defend ourselves so mm. just, just like the whole country of africa everybody can come in there and take what they want to take Con and continent yeah mm -hmm. there's no there's no ability to defend so anybody can come in it's like looting you can just come in there and take what you want and the, the people who are losing are helpless so it's the same mm -hmm. thing so until there's a financial stability within the community and we, we have it with our dollars it's just that we, we lack the financial acumen as a as a as a race um, i i don't want to make it sound like there aren't very successful people of color in the industry but as a percentage of the whole, it's so minuscule that it, it's not even a, it's not even a, a drip in an ocean. It's, it's, it's not relevant. So we have to grow those numbers in terms of literacy, and then you'll understand how to use that literacy to leverage it uh, for the benefit of, of, of the creators. And that's really what I'm purporting to do. And, and that's, if you hear my, if you watch my articles and you listen to my interviews, I speak on the same subject all the time because it's really my passion. Mm. Uh, so tell me, like, what what uh, are some of the things that excite you about uh, blockchains, and some of the things that perhaps uh, give you nightmares or make you sleep a little easy, or or maybe you know not even worried that much, but you have some real concerns. What what is it? Tell us a bit from your eyes, from your journey. What has been uh, things to watch for, and or, you know what you're worried about. I'll give you I'll give you one of each one. One of the things that excites me the most about blockchain is where we are where we are in the blockchain space is where the internet was 20 years ago. And, mm. and if you think about how many how much wealth was created from the internet. If you can go back in 20 years would you become would you have been a part of Apple or Amazon or Microsoft? You know, those companies took the internet and they ran with it. We're here again now. So for those who missed the internet, we're here now again with blockchain. And, um, and, and that opportunity here is dwarfs that of internet because of the different opportunities that blockchain are going to present. So it's gonna create wealth at a rate that's gonna make the internet um, uh, look like peanuts. So that's mm. the, on the, on the flip side, there's so much, because we have so much, anybody can access any kind of information they want on their smartphones, there's, uh, that's also a problem. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, of, of fear and lack of the right information that it's causing people to be a confusion that is that mm. can hurt people. Um, and then once bad news, whether it's accurate or not gets into the marketplace it's very tough to change the, the narrative so i'm very worried about that the other thing i'm worried about is because so many companies are coming to market with product there's a high rate of failure in the marketplace right now so a lot of these ideas are not going to work out just like in the dot-com era a lot of those dot-com companies that were going to be the next best thing those companies no longer exist because of the rate of failure the rate of mm -hmm. failure as much as the opportunity is going to dwarf internet, the rate of failure is also going to dwarf internet. So to the investors, I say, stay patient, um, look for good teams. And if something doesn't work out once, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It just hasn't been thought through. So instead of abandoning a, an idea that doesn't work, take the time that's needed in order to make it work. And the reason I'm worried is because in our the way we live right now, we live in an instant gratification society. Yep. If something doesn't work the first time. Now, 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 now. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Just on to the next thing. Just, just like dating, or just you know, there's no, you know, if if you have one bad date, they're gone. So, so it's in, in this market. But if the idea doesn't work out the first time, it's not a bad idea. Spend time, take time 
to make it work. And I think that that's the fear that a lot of good ideas are going to be trashed because they didn't work the first time. So that's mm. my, yeah. But there's many, but I'll give you, I gave you one on each side. And so I, I know you spoke a little bit in regards to that uh, earlier in regards to uh, marketing uh, in terms because I was asking you about how do we communicate this to um, our people because they, they're spending trillions of dollars a year. Uh, and if you take that on a global aspect, uh, black people everywhere, we, we are incredibly powerful to the point where um, I believe industries would be, uh, I mean, wholesale, <laughs> they would be devastated if we right. withdrew, if we knew okay. our collective power. Okay. So speak on that, because how do we engage our people? When I say our people, I'm talking collectively, not African-Americans. Yeah. How yeah. do we uh, speak to diaspora? Um, I guess we have to have uh, adapt it to market by market, um, country by country, because it does there's uh, lifestyle uh, factors and other things, but if we br focus on the things that we have in common, uh, the shared values that we have and, um, and, and some of the, what can I say? Some of the ideas uh, that have already been proposed is, is a step in the right direction, but how do we engage our people to see the opportunities in the blockchain space, despite it being, uh, and the crypto space, despite the bear market, how do we set the, how, I guess, how do we make them more patient and more um, dr drive their energy and their passion that they have uh, for certain things and, and try and simplify the process and make them see that, hey, this is an opportunity. The, these um, disruptive technologies don't come uh, this often. So, and this is the biggest one yet. So how do we uh, bridge that gap and engage them and get them to say, hey, come on board. If I can do it, you can do it too. What, what's this your ideas good. around that? It, it's just about visibility. We, it's, everybody now has a platform in their pocket and it's called Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We all have platforms now as much mm. as people. You know how many people follow you on your platform is different but it's about visibility uh, if others can see successes from mm. people do what you do look look how you look think what you think if you can show those successes then other people will think hey i can get involved in that too i'm working on something maybe we can create teams together collaboration is very important i think that it's about visibility there's no longer there's there's like like my business film is a very collaborative thing no filmmaker can make a movie without the help of thousands of hundreds, if not thousands of people and places. Um, same with this. It has to be collaborative, but everybody's working in their own little space. There has to be somewhere where you can connect. There has to be somewhere where you can be visible. There has to be somewhere where you can not only uh, go and seek help, but give help because you might have the piece to a puzzle that the other person might not have to make their thing work. It's all about visibility. And I think that if we can do that, I think that the market will grow. Um, as consumers, we like to be visible, but, but as creators, we want to keep our secrets to ourselves. And I think that that's, mm. that's, that's a very poor way of thinking. I think if you put your, it, it's, if you put your, it's like open source programming. If you put your idea out there, somebody might have a thought of something that you didn't think of and together you can grow. So it's about visibility. Mm. It's really about visibility in what we do because every, nobody has the nobody has a moratorium on good ideas and nobody has a moratorium on creativity. Yeah, that is inc spot on with that. And again, speaking to our uh, creativity and our ingenuity, I th I think you wrote there with the you know especially with the struggles and adversity uh, we've gone through. So this would be a perfect. Uh, fit for us because we seem to make any opportunity we get we not only um, you know take it and run with it we make it our own we flavor it and season it our way and then everyone else notices and wants to copy us that's right exactly exactly but if you just take that one step further and rather than uh, you know we do it on a retail level if you will but if we took that same concept and built it on the wholesale level where you're actually mm creating it being the owner there's there's a handful of companies that have done it successfully but most times we're just so satisfied with just being the consumer as opposed mm. to and i think that if we just took it one step deeper and said what if i what if i built a business around this concept how many where can i go from there the more we do that 
the more we start to gain economic, uh, economic empowerment. It really comes down to taking ownership of the creative process, not just handing it over to somebody else, but actually going out and raising the resources and making it happen on your own and building the team around mm -hmm. you to get it done. That is so true. Acquisition, ownership, um, and, and custody, because it, it seems to be coming back to that, um, that we're busy making everyone wealthy but ourselves so uh in in more ways than one so it's it's just incredible in fact i i'd like i would love to speak on this because um in regards to uh what do you call it uh, can we hold that question i just have to plug in before i lose you i'm, I'm oh on. sure sure just give me one minute yeah So you guys, um, I hope uh, you, you're you tuning in and you got some of that because uh, this is uh, an incredible time to be alive, in my opinion, with some of the things um, going down in blockchain space, uh, crypto space, and uh, uh, the film industry, finance industry, any industry that you uh, guys are in, whether you're working or want to go into, um, it's a great time to be alive. We have opportunities um, everywhere around us. And uh, certainly we have our ch struggles, challenges and uh, trials and tribulations. But all I'm seeing and all I'm hearing and I'm observing, uh, you know, black excellence everywhere. Um, so this definitely is a, a great time to be alive. That's that's how I see it, guys. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, uh, what I was going to add to that was uh, in regards to um, uh, Africa, the natural resources uh, has been in the spotlight recently. There was, in fact, there was a documentary. Um, you, I, I don't know if you guys uh, tune into the BBC, but uh, uh, there's going to be a documentary that will go out uh, regarding the DRC, the Democratic uh, Re Republic of Congo. It's a history natural resources and some of the uh, issues it had uh, with colonization period uh, and so on but they uh, they, they did some in-depth research uh, into it and regarding the uh, they said something that really really uh, struck me hard and that was the fact that the the resources underground uh, I know coltan is uh, one of those precious elements that you get in mobile phones and electronic devices that is um, I think the Chinese are also trying to um, get, get you know get as much of the control with the Africans resources uh, natural resources apparently it's worth multi trillions of dollars the natural uh, um, resources underneath uh, the DRC, Congo. Right. Right. And I'm just thinking, it's how do we get um, the blockchain in, in blockchain in Africa is exploding uh, crypto, the, especially with crypto mining, despite the bear market, they're, they're still being um, uh, adopting that. But uh, I know with Kenya, you may have heard that the uh, Uhuru um, uh, I think it's, he, I forgot his name. Um, I think he's Uhuru, isn't it? The president of Kenya? Yes. Yeah. Um, but he, he um, took a proactive approach to start legislation uh, and putting in bills that are crypto friendly, blockchain friendly, and trying to establish themselves. Uh, I know in Nigeria, South Africa, they're working on that. Uh, but it really goes to the heart of what you're saying that we we as a community at worldwide uh, in the diaspora we have so much uh access to resource we just don't know how so um it's really inspirational that we have individuals like you that are blazing the way you know trend um put, putting a, the flag up and saying hey this is i've done it this is the way this is one of the ways forwards um so what tell me more about um like some of the individuals or if you have a mentor or friend or so any particular individuals that come to mind or community that have really helped you along the way to to go from not recognizing or seeing certain things to be like wow i mean this experience was fundamental to me getting this uh advance right one of the um, most influential mm -hmm. to me in my financial life and 
sort of has me where I am today is a gentleman by the name of David Rothberg. I speak mm. about him very often. And when I was starting out in the business as, as, as a newcomer into the industry, he was a very high level, powerful hedge fund manager. You know, and this is going way back. You know, he was one of the sort of founding fathers of private equity and the hedge fund concept. And he was, at the time when I started, he probably was managing, it, but it seems insignificant now, but he was probably managing around $300 million. By, by, I, and that was, this is going back 30 years. So that's how powerful he was. And, and I met him just on one of my daily trips to, to do my work. And we took a liking to each other. And he realized that I had this burning ambition to learn the business. And just based on my interest in the industry and my willingness to learn, he took time out of his day on a daily basis to sit with me in his office, show me his financial analysis strategies, how money worked, how the Federal Reserve worked, how central banking worked, uh, micro and macro economics, how it affects corporate, corporate uh, revenue, profitability. And I was astounded by that. And I couldn't have learned. He gave me literally a university education on how the markets work. And not only that, I think the most important thing that he did for me was he opened do doors for me to get the jobs that are pretty much closed off to, to the outsider. He, he, he opened the door with his relationships. And, you know, so he, he opened the door for me and I walked in, but it was, it was up to me to stay inside that door. I think I did that. So, so, so I think, and that's another thing that I think is, is vital in this economic space is you need mentors. You have to have mm. people who you can mimic, um, people who you can follow. And I think, and I think that in this business, we don't have enough people that look like us that do what we do. And I think that that's so, so sometimes it's a little bit harder to see yourself doing that because nobody around you looks like that. I struggled with that for a very long time. Mm. And, you know, I, I want to add to that as well, because, um, you know, with LeBron opening his school in Akron and, you know, um, who else was it? Little John uh, opening a school in Ghana, uh, in West Africa. Um, who else? Uh, Akron uh, in um, Senegal uh, and, and him wanting to start Acoin is <laughs> will uh, fuel uh, blockchain. Sorry, uh, alarm went off. Uh, yeah, uh, a blockchain city somewhere in Senegal. So, uh, you, you, we do have these celebrities that are, you know, try, you know, trying to be ro good role model, good role models, and and using some of their resources to um, to start us having that. Uh, education that is missing uh, and having s some level of pride and also you know different ways that we can realize our dreams and, and our passions so right. what what's your thought on that like do you think part of the you mentioned it earlier regarding the marketing aspect but do you think it, we need more ce black celebrities to help uh, no. pave the way to or, no. or what is it that we need to come you know to get people to see the special uh, things that are happening and how we can extract that natural resource out of them. I think um, the celebrities do a good job of funneling their money that they've earned doing what their, their, their specialty is. Mm. I think they, just like Oprah, just like LeBron, I think they do a good job of using money and pointing it in the direction of education and that education. So, so in that respect, it's good, but now you have to take it a step further and ask what is the quality of the education that they are getting inside that school? I think mm. I, in the, as an individual think that education as a whole, the system is broken and it's, yeah. not, giving, it's not giving people who are coming out of university now the tools they need to survive in the world as we see it today. I think the professors that are teaching kids now, they don't even understand the technology that they, they need to be able, the technology and the processes in the system. They don't know it themselves. So what are they teaching our kids? They don't understand blockchain. They don't understand um, pearl coding. They don't understand the things that run our system. So yes, they're teaching us history. They're teaching us 
certain socio skills, social economic skills, mathematics. Some of the things are, are good, but how to survive in today's economy is not a class taught in universities. So the mm. athletes, the athletes yep. are doing a good job of using their resources to educate, to, to get kids who wouldn't normally get an education, an education, but they got to go a step further and change the curriculums. Until the curriculums are changed in, in order to educate young people on how to earn money in the new world, there's mm. um, you know, I, I, you don't even have to have an office anymore or have an employer in order to do big, big numbers in terms of business. You're not getting that education. And so, so to, to, to zero back in on your original question, I think athletes are giving people a false hope because there's only one LeBron James. There's only one Akon. And so, so, but everybody wants to be like LeBron or Michael Jordan, and you can't have that. So, so as much as, so sometimes it's hurtful because LeBron James doesn't know anything about high finance. He's a basketball player, you know? He's able to enter the world of high finance because he's bought his way in there. Mm. He has enough money and he's earning enough money that he gets the attention of the high finance people. How many people are there like that, like LeBron James? Two, three maybe? So what about the rest of us? How do we learn or how to participate in those marketplaces? We can't because we don't have the money and resources to do that. So we're still left out. So in a way it's good, but it's, it's giving a false hope. Mm. And just to add to, to that as well, really, it's about getting them to see as th them being... Um, the key, the answer, and we cannot do it without them. Um, I'm, I'm talking about each individual that aspires to be something uh, bigger and larger than themselves yeah. and, and right. seeing, right. because it's that sense of belonging, isn't it? That we right. feel some, there's a disconnect and it may be certain, uh, you know, factors add, compounding that problem, but how, how do we cut through that noise? Because it's just like, we're bombarded by different uh, images, different uh, topics, dialogues, and you know, people looking for validation or approval and so on. It's really getting to, you know, talking about the in in order before they can even have high self esteem. How how do we communicate that they are the key, they are the one, they are the answer? But for them to really believe it. What, what, I feel like, they have to, they have you know, what will it take <laughs> to speak to our they, people? They have to, they have to see examples. I, I think, I think that's why you, you, you follow what you know, and there's just not enough of those. Ex I, I, I wish, I, I wish there was an answer, a better answer, but most people follow what they know. That's why you see of, of anything, there's more rappers and athletes coming out uh, than anything, because that's what they see and know, you know, how many how many Barack Obamas do you see coming up? One. Mm. You know, I'm sure, but because of him, I can tell you that it's inspired a whole lot of other people to join politics and get involved that way. So, so in that respect, it's positive. But until you see, I, I, I mentioned it in one of my pieces, until we see other people that are succeeding in those areas and we're visible, so, um, it's going to be difficult. You're out there doing what you're doing for your for your uh, followers and and creating a path for somebody who could be watching your show. So so the more pe the more we do and the more we set examples of it can be done. I think other people will get inspired, and that's how how it will work. There, there's no other. There's no other. There's no other way. There's unfortunately it's a slow process, and we're so behind the curve. But um, but I think that. What I'm doing is opening the door for some filmmakers. If they tell yep. their stories, other filmmakers will, will have the inspiration and the, and the energy to, to, to do it. And I think that that's how it has to happen now. It, it started. We just don't have enough. And again, I don't want to make it seem like the athletes of the world aren't doing their part. They're doing what they know. Uh, they're, they're, they're putting up their money. I just think the curriculum is broken. So school is great. Education is fantastic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have anything without it, but 
everything is changing at the speed of light, education is not. So there's mm. a, again, there's another, there's, but again, in, in and of what I'm saying, there's an opportunity that's presenting itself. Somebody has to start creating a curriculum that is in line with today's world and economy. And I think that that responsibility of all places where I, in my humble opinion, think that that place lies, I think it's with companies like Google, companies like Amazon, because when right now, when we want to, when we as individuals want to know anything or verify anything, we go to Google, we Google it. I think they have to start, they almost have to have a university of technical learning where you can go and learn how things like this work. It's not up to the LeBron James or the Acons to do that. It's about we're using technology and devices that are being created by people. They need to be able to educate us how to, how to get along with, that, with those very same technologies. Hmm. And um, I was going to say, speaking of uh, being that change, being, you know, paving the way, um, going back to uh, the trading floor, uh, Lauren Simmons, I think she set a record for being the youngest uh, equities trader or something, 23 years old, and only the, the second African-American uh, to do so. Okay. And so, some of the conversations that uh, that came out of that, it, it made a, people a lot more uh, interested in wanting to join the finance world, at least to inquire, right. because right. like you right. said, is that we need to be present and visible. And that's visible. so important. Yeah, yeah. So once you see you one said. person doing it, you know, once you see somebody who looks like you doing it, you're automatically inspired to say, hey, what is that, first of all? And if they can do it, I can do it, you know. Some people take inspiration from anything. I took my inspiration from Michael Douglas and Charlie Sheen on a, a, in a movie, you know. Um, some people need a little bit more closer to home, having it be people who look and, and look like them, think like yeah. them. Whatever it takes, we just need that visibility. And I, 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 I mentioned that in, in, the, in the other article, we're lacking the visibility of the successes of people who look like us. We're, we're only seeing... I, I, I'm, let me, let me rephrase that because I, did, I, I really want to make sure that I'm clear. We're only ever seeing the successes as, as Blacks. We're only ever seeing the successes of certain groups. Athletes, entertainers primarily, uh, uh, singers, which are entertainers. We need to see successes in the other areas. Politics, yeah. mathematics, business. Those Blacks aren't as visible and and, and it's because we're not as interesting as the athlete or the singer. Mm. So we, have to, we have to make it just as interesting. So I think, I think that the way that the athletes help is that when you see the Michael Jordans take his, take his success from the basketball court into the world of business and create what he's created. He's, he's a billionaire now, almost two billion. Those are the examples that are more interesting to me than what he did on a basketball court because i don't think anybody can do what he did on a basketball court but he took the money that he made and the education that he learned and he turned it into something else in a whole nother career him guys like him lebron tiger woods magic johnson these are all going to be businessmen and i'll say one more thing about athletes i think what we're going to see what we're going to see for the first time is that athlete for the first time in our lives are mm. going to be the new business people, the Steph Curry's, the, the Kevin Durant's they're who they're following right now. They're following who they see as an example. And that's Michael Jordan. They saw mm. Michael Jordan take his success off on the basketball court and turn it into business. So that's who they're following as an example, because right now it's the only example when you think about it. Mike, Michael Jordan is the only black owner of a basketball team that used to be a player. He's the only one. Mm. And I, I want to add to that as well. Speak, uh, Sycamore Entertainment, um, what, <laughs> what other areas will you branch out to? Um, I thought I'd add that in as well oh, oh, uh, with, oh. with the tree. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit corny sometimes, but um, what are there any other areas that you wanted to diversify? And was it just going to be film and uh, finance, uh, or was 
it's pretty much going to be primarily film. Um, some of the other things that we want to do, it sort of is in the same vein. It's just different ways of, of, of marketing business. Um, we want to do more with, with blockchain. And then we want to get into uh, merchandise because the next level of business is um, when you go see a movie right now, um, the actors are wearing costumes, clothing, um, they're driving cars, they're using mm. things in the film. We want to be able to um, have using blockchain and that technology, we want to be able to have people, if they see a jacket on screen, they can inquire about that jacket and purchase it directly online after the movie or whatever. So those tech, we want to be involved in that commerce that's coming along. It's part of the new technology. So we want to have systems in place to be able to get into merchandising and do business with Amazons and the retailers of the world that are, that are providing the costumes for these actors and take, and because we're the people doing the distribution and they're see, and these, these customers are seeing the movies in our theaters, we want to be able to do revenue shares. If we sell a jacket on the actor or a pair of shoes, mm. we want to do that kind of, but that's all technology back-end based and back-end retailing. Th those are the kinds of technologies we want to back into using blockchain. Sweet. And how can I follow, uh, how can we follow you? Like where, where you are in terms of uh, online presence? Uh, my, my primary online presence for Sycamore is uh, Twitter. Um, at Sycamore Films is the handle. Um, also, sycamoreentertainment.com is our website, which we're doing a fabulous reconstruction on. So we're looking forward to that. And, and also, you can get me on LinkedIn, uh, Edward Sylvan, uh, on LinkedIn, as well as my personal uh, Twitter, which is at Edward Sylvan. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much, uh, Edward, for joining us. Uh, that was definitely uh, inspiring. And I really will be uh, thinking long term um, in terms of what we can do to uh, collaborate, uh, whether I'm here in London, you're in Canada, uh, we can always do something to um, uh, collaborate in different areas. So I definitely will be following you. And uh, yeah. Uh, if there's uh, any questions uh, anyone has, guys, feel free to hit us up uh, anytime. And uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us, Edward. I know I've taken uh, some time. <laughs> we, we are so grateful to you. And uh, we, I certainly enjoyed it. I, I'm sure everyone else is as well. Thank you so much. Perfect. I look well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you guys for joining us um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.